I'm Daniel Levine, and this is the Bio Report. Despite the success of immunotherapies to date, about 75-80% to of cancer patients don't respond to current immunotherapy treatments. Farron Pharmaceuticals is hoping to change that with its experimental therapy, Bexmerilumab, which is in development to treat myelodysplastic syndrome. Bexmerilumab targets Clever-1, a checkpoint inhibitor found on macrophages, a type of myeloid cell that plays an essential role in the immune system. We spoke to Yuho Yalkinen, founder and CEO of Farron, about how the tumor microenvironment can suppress macrophages, how the company's macrophage checkpoint inhibitor works, and the challenges a Finland-based company faces accessing the capital markets. Yuho, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Danny. Great to be here. We're going to talk about a, a group of rare and aggressive blood cancers known as myodysplastic syndrome, Farron Pharmaceuticals, and its efforts to develop immunotherapies to treat these and other cancers. Let's start with myelodysplastic syndrome, though. What is it? Yeah, so that's a great question. MDS, as we call it, it's a, it's a rare form of leukemia. All blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, they're produced in the bone marrow. Now, a specific cell type called the macrophages take over. That, they're now the cancerous cell type, and the bone marrow only produces those cancerous cells. And then the healthy production of red blood cells, white blood cells diminishes, so you're deeply anemic and deeply neutropenic prone to all kinds of infections and, and so forth. So it's a, basically it's your classical movie thing. You're deeply anemic, uh, you get chemo, you lose hair, you can't go outside, you're afraid of infections, so it's, it's gruesome. And how does MDS manifest itself and progress? Well, uh, as it progresses, the more and more the bone marrow produces those cancerous cell types, and then the healthy cells are not eventually produced at all and unfortunately that it leads to death usually through infections uh, so that's the big manifestation of it and the problem is life expectancy is very short and there's not much going for these patients well what treatment options exist and, and what is the prognosis for someone diagnosed so the only cure for this disease is a bone marrow transplant but the problem is it's an intensive treatment usually these mds patients they're elderly and they can't take intensive chemo and and a bone marrow transplant then there's also the availability of suitable transplants uh, which is not that common so after that the only real treatment is a hypomethylating agent, an HMA. It's a, a form of chemo, basically. All drugs that have been around for 20 years, the market leader is azacitidine. We call it aza. And that's the frontline treatment. And if you fail th to that, and majority of patients, unfortunately, eventually fail, then after that, there's really nothing. Before we discuss your experimental therapy, dexmerilumab, uh, can you explain what a macrophage is and, and its function? Yes. So a part of the immune system, the purpose of the macrophage is to go around, eat debris, dying cells, and foreign matter, like cancer, and present it to the immune system. Hey, immune system, here's cancer. Go kill it. So that's the purpose of, of the macrophage. Now, in the context of MDS, for example, this macrophage-specific cancer, 
the macrophages have gone wild, they're not actually presenting themselves of ca- as cancer to the immune system. So that's how the, the cancer just can grow and, and hide from the immune system. But what happens in MDS that allows the the disease to hijack the macrophages and get them to suppress the immune system? That's exactly the core point because now that, again, thinking of the role of a macrophage in the immune system, and now that they've gone all wild, misbehaving, so they're all misbehaving cancerous cells which are not performing the job they're supposed to. That's why this disease is probably so difficult to treat because now the cancer cells, they are deeply immunosuppressive and are not reacting to anything we're trying against them. Well, what is bexmerilumab and and how does it work? That's the key point because we believe we're addressing some of the core biology of the disease. So basically, in a nutshell, we're making these macro pages behave again like they should so lever one is the target bex merlimab targets we're going to call it bex from here on and it's a it's the master immunosuppressive regulator basically on the macrophage so we're going to tackle that with bex so instead of being immunosuppressive uh, we put it back to its place it starts behaving normally and this is how actually the bone marrow starts producing, again, normal, healthy blood cells. So, again, this is not toxic like conventional treatments like chemo. Most of the immune therapies we've seen to date target different cells within the immune system. What's the case for targeting macrophages? You're absolutely correct. Most of the immunotherapies target T cells. And again, as a part of the immune system, the T cells are kind of the soldiers that then attack cancer. But somebody needs to guide the T cells. And like I just mentioned, the purpose of the macrophage is to present the cancer to the T cells. So macrophages are the the guiding cells, basically. But macrophages have been notoriously difficult. So A big part of immunotherapy is concentrated on T cells. It's a more straightforward cell to target and and make to behave. But macrophages are are the guiding cells, kind of the generals of the army. And you need to make those behave to then get the T cells to work. But macrophage targets so far have not been that good. But I think we're now, we've been doing research for 20 years in this field. We believe we now master this. Does targeting the macrophages do anything to enlist other cells within the immune system in the fight against the cancer? Yes, it does. And that's that's the core thing because macrophage being, well, let's call it the general now giving the orders to the other cells, B, T cells, but also, for example, B cells, which are important cell type for the immune system also natural killer cells which are very important when killing cancer so what we've seen is when we reprogram these macrophages with bex so in layman terms make them behave again the macrophages are going to activate t cells nk cells and b cells against cancer in the case of mds you're pursuing bex in combination with azacitidine which you, you mentioned earlier is the standard of care for mds What's the case for doing this? So, again, we're, this MDS is a highly aggressive and progressive disease, which, which progresses fast and life expectancy is very low. So we do all this reprogramming, make the immune system work. It takes a little time. So that's why we're still combining with the standard of care cytotoxic, in other words, killing agent, because we need still some to be killing the disease that otherwise it progresses so rapidly so meanwhile we get to work on the immune system and make it work while we still have the killing agent killing away the cancer because what we've seen now is that like i mentioned the problem with aza is that 50 percent don't respond at all and the majority eventually relapse now we've seen that actually then we add in back now they're responsive again. So we can make AISA work again when it's already failed, which is kind of amazing. And what's known about it from the studies you've done to date? 
Yeah, so we've just uh, finished up a phase two study, just reported in major medical conferences. And we've been treating in this phase two, we've been treating relapsed refractory MDS. So that's basically the last line MDS that has lost all options. So failed, basically AISA and even other treatments that have been tested. And we've shown, and usually these patients, the life expectancy is only five to six months, so next to nothing, and nothing seems to work. Now we got a response rate of 63, which is basically unheard of. And we've taken that survival from 5.6 months to 13.4 months. So it looks like we're at least doubling survival. A lot of these patients are still ongoing and on drug when they usually, unfortunately, should be dead by now, but they're doing awfully well on the drug. And what's the development path forward? So next, actually, we're going to an end of phase two meeting with the FDA to discuss the phase three study design. So that's the big, big next event happening actually very soon. And then we'll come out with the phase three plan and, and hoping to get this drug approved pretty soon because it looks like it'd be a game changer for these patients. You're also looking at Bex as a, a single agent in solid tumors as well as in combination with PDL1 inhibitors. What's the case for combining this with a, a PD1 inhibitor? So we've actually also done a study in solid tumors. Uh, and we've shown again, similar to what we're seeing in MDS, where we're overcoming treatment resistance that we can really reprogram these macrophages. We can shape the tumor microenvironment so that the T cells, all the other immunotherapies could now actually work when usually they don't. So the plan is, again, to prove to the world that we can overcome treatment resistance, for example, towards PD-1s, which would be huge. You're going to be conducting a, a basket trial across a, a number of solid tumors. How broad a set of cancers do you expect to consider? Basically very broad, but, but as a small biotech, we can only do so much. So eventually we will likely partner to get, you know, broader development shoulders. Because what we've seen is that through biobank screenings, these highly immunosuppressive clever one macrophages, they're, they're present in up to 20 to 30% of all cancers. So when you find these highly immunosuppressive macrophages in a tumor, it's like, like very aggressive, non-responsive to treatments. And like I mentioned, 20 to 30% of all cancers seem to have this. So that's a big set of patients. The company's raised about 91 million since 2023. Most recently, it raised money through a, a convertible bomb and eliminated outstanding secured debt. What did that do for Farron? Gave us a little bit of freedom to operate as we now completed the phase two. So we're now well financed into next year and we still have that convertible bond to pull on additional uh, cash because biotech is, is a lot about cash. But we're well positioned to make the next decisions, business transactions while we take this drug into phase three in MDS. What's the discussion been like with investors and does being based in Finland have any effect on your ability to access capital? Unfortunately, it does. Uh, Finnish, great place of, you know, high education, academic science, capital markets are pretty poor compared to, for example, the US. We got a strong, long lasting shareholder basis out of Finland, but it's not the kind that really sustains late stage development. So for that, bigger pools of capital are needed and they really cannot be found in Finland. So is there a plan to to reach out either to investors in Europe or the United States? That is always the plan for biotechs. Juho Jalkinen, founder and CEO of Farron Pharmaceuticals. Juho, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, Danny. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening. The Bio Report is a production of the Levine Media Group. To automatically download this podcast each week, subscribe to our RSS feed or through iTunes or other podcast manager. 
To join our mailing list, go to levinemediagroup.com. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to drop us a line or are interested in sponsoring this podcast, send an email to danny at levinemediagroup.com. Special thanks to Jonah Levine, who composed our theme music, and the Jonah Levine Collective, which performs it.